13 very special guests for you. And we'll start with a man who's been very busy, the Chief Executive of the British Horse Racing Authority, Nick Rust. Nick, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling very optimistic for the resumption of the sport and uh, very pleased for the 20,000 people involved in the sport that we can get going. Um, and we've got going really at the first opportunity um, after the government's guidelines have been announced. So I'm, I'm really pleased. I'm very pleased about the massive um, team effort across the sport that's delivered this. What do you think was the single most compelling factor in enabling racing to resume tomorrow? Well, I, I, I think there are many. We made the case about our industry all the way along with government. Um, but I think that the single factor is that uh, there, a number of decisions had to be made along the way since racing was suspended until resumption about how we position things, um, about what we would say, about you know the protocols that we needed to develop. And those were worked on together by the industry's leaders uh, with a commonness of purpose. And it is that which has delivered racing back at the earliest opportunity. What do you think will be the biggest challenge in the short term for the next two or three weeks? What will be the, the biggest logistical challenge for the sport? Well, I think everyone needs to get uh, completely familiar with the protocols in practice. And we've got a great plan, but even with the very best planning, we need to make sure we carry it out in, in practice. And we're going to have horses coming from different parts of the country being travelled with individuals who need to go through a screening procedure both before they leave and when they arrive at the races and then follow protocols at the race course and as we saw with two test days that we held at Lingfield this week we benefited from uh, running those. The first of those was really BHA officials who are going to be responsible for managing the race day with race days with uh, race course people uh, and the second one was a more full-blown test on Friday where we ran uh, three races or three jump outs um, going through the full race day procedure. And there are one or two areas that, um, that, we, that are pinch points that we need to make sure that we're focusing on. But those, those, those two days were extremely helpful in making sure that we're ready at Newcastle on Monday. Um, on Monday, we've got the situation where we've only got one meeting to concentrate on and all of the relevant people who are going to be managing race meetings uh, for the BHA and some other officials from race courses and so on will be closely involved um, in Newcastle um, and we can start to ensure that we continue to pick up lessons to make sure that our plan is delivered. So that's the real focus. We, we must bring back racing safely for all of the people involved, uh, minimise risk and reassure the public that we can do this. But I'm, I'm exceptionally confident that we will be able to hold our heads very high about the way that the sport returns. Was there any thought of doing a walkthrough or a dry run at Newcastle because it's the first site and we'll have a number of race days before Lingfield get going? There was. Um, the issue really was that uh, ahead of the 1st of June, many of the individuals who would be required to um, undergo such a test from the BHA officials' point of view are actually based in the south. So Dr Jerry Hill, for example, who's absolutely key to the work that we've done and has done an amazing job um, with other chief medical officers in conjunction with Public Health England and the DCM and DCMS. Um, he's close to Lingfield. Brant Dunshay lives in the south as well. And we didn't want to waste too much time on the planning that was required um, to, to, take, to take the testing day out of the other activities that we needed to do. Ideally, we would have run it at Newcastle, but we did have some people who are involved at Newcastle um, and Brant and Jerry, for example, are going to be up at Newcastle um, tomorrow as well. So um, it was really just practicalities in the final week. We're having a look at one of the information videos that you've produced for the, the whole industry. And we can see there the um, staff from the BHA are wearing um, face masks, uh, PPE. Just, just to make sure everybody's aware, who, who has to wear um, PPE on a race course now? Well, anyone who's involved in the medical side or in cleaning activities must wear um, a, a fuller form of medical grade uh, PPE, so including masks, 
gloves, aprons, and so on. Um, perhaps if I just take you through briefly the the procedure that that is in place for anyone attending. Um, no one can attend or will be admitted to a race course if they've not passed three screening tests. One of those is completing successfully the online training with regard to social distancing and uh, PPE. Uh, and so everyone has had to complete that. We, we've launched that on the Racing to Learn website, which was only launched a few weeks ago to provide the place where you can access all vocational training in respect of uh, horse racing. So it was uh, really good because we've got more than 5,000 signups to that with people doing, um, doing those tests. So you have to have passed that. Um, you have to complete a personal health questionnaire uh, before you attend the race course. You need to bring that with you. There are then you then need to enter via designated area at the race course. Instructions are given from each race course about each race day, uh, where temperature checks and other medical assessments will take place before anyone can enter the race course. We ask all people to bring face coverings with them, um, and face coverings need to be worn um, in certain areas at certain times. If you are not in a role at the race course that requires um, a breach of social distancing. So in other words, jockeys and stalls handlers will um, breach the two metre rule in the course of the work that they carry out, but most other individuals involved in, in racing will, will not. Um, then the only uh, protection you need, other than following the social distancing rules, is um, a face covering in certain circumstances. Um, the jockeys, as, you, as you'll be aware, will need to wear face coverings. Um, but this doesn't, you know, as we've been saying to everyone, just because you're wearing a face covering, you know, we still need everyone in as far as possible to observe the um, social distancing rules. The layouts of the weighing rooms, the parade rings and so on, um, and the requirements on a race day have all been amended. Um, we're not operating with crowds, obviously, so we don't need horses to go around the parade ring three or four times before a race. We do want to keep some availability for media of course in terms of showing pictures for people watching at home um, but we're relaxing those sorts of requirements um, we, we're no longer requiring uh, trainers or their representatives to check in um, for at the declarations clerk that will all be done off the microchip assessment when horses are being checked in so we've adjusted all of our processes to get back to the absolute minimum needed yeah. at this time there's one-way systems operating mm. in the weighing room and so on Nick uh, last night, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Matt Hancock, who is the MP for, for Newmarket or, or West Suffolk and is clearly a, a big friend of horse racing, said, thanks to the nation's resolve, horse racing is back from Monday. Wonderful news for our wonderful sport. Yeah, clearly a sentiment that you'll agree with and, and I'll, I'll agree with. Given the government's warnings to the BHA not to be too triumphalist about this, would you rather he hadn't sent that tweet, given the reaction that it's garnered from the wider public? Well, look, that's up to Matt. He's he's obviously a, a big fan of racing, has been involved in it, ridden in charity races and so on, and is the local MP there. Um, and, you know, that's the way he feels about it. Um, we're, we're just very pleased that racing has strong links with government um, and the hours and hours and hours that many people across the sport have put in to help make our case, including with some assistance from... Matt Hancock, um, we're delighted that that's in place. And, you know, I can understand why my, uh, Matt is delighted that it's back. It's a sport that he loves. True, but do you accept the fact that, given the warnings from government, for us to be circumspect about the message we put out and our responsibility to society, that that is brave, some would say foolish, of a cabinet minister to hold racing out there as... Um, as an, a sport, an entity that the public can 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 rally round and beat, essentially, if they if they so choose, if that's their if that's their viewpoint. Uh, look, it's a matter for him, Nick. I, I, I um, we we we've been very careful, as you know, all the way through to to make sure that we um, are in in harmony with the government and public position. Um, we've followed 
the guidelines from government and Public Health England throughout. And I think that's stood us in good stead. We were being put under pressure, as you know, to announce a date. We didn't announce a date until we were sure that, the, that, that there was a window which government was allowing us, if you like, to name our date. And that came three weeks ago. Um, I'm very glad we didn't name a date um, before then. I'm glad we named the 1st of June and that the industry got organised to deliver on the earliest possible day it could in conjunction with government and public health advice. Do you think your, your communication strategy over the next few weeks is going to have to be more robust than ever it has been before? Um, I don't know than ever before, but it's going to have to be strong and robust, yes. Um, you know, we saw what happened around Cheltenham, but again, I think that we've been very much on the front foot of the clarity around that, that again, we followed government advice. I think some of the films and... Uh, material that we've produced showing what will take place on a race day and seeking to assure people um, about the fact that you know people are returning to work on Monday across numerous industries and the level of screening and activity in the work in our workplace at the race course will far exceed the vast majority of employment situations for others returning to work on Monday and you know we will just have to keep making that clear uh, we'll keep needing to inform people about the very limited numbers of people who are going to attend on a race day. Um, I'm going to Newcastle tomorrow, but I'm not entering the area that is restricted. I'm, I'm only there to speak to some of the news media who will, um, who will want to talk about the resumption, and they're all being positioned outside the race course area. And, um, you know, we, we have taken the very, very hard decision to restrict uh, access to owners at the moment um, for, for another short period, which we hope to, yeah. hope to lift. But given that they have been so loyal, so loyal over the last two months in keeping horses in training and paying for them and keeping the industry, um, the horseman side going as best they could, I think massive thanks to them and we want to relax things as soon as we can yes. for them. You've in part uh, answered my next question, which is when do you see the first phase of relaxation? When do you see any semblance of people other than the absolutely essential being allowed onto the race course? Can you put any time frame on that? I can't yet, but I, th and I think we just need to be really careful. I mean, I, it's, it's understandable that there is excitement, nervous excitement last week, um, excitement after Thursday when the Prime Minister said we're, we're moving into the second phase post lockdown and that the tests had been met. Um, and it was suddenly a bit like from some parts of the industry that well, we can just go full steam ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and of course we can't. We've got to comply with the, with the regulations. But everyone is focused on managing risk and making sure that we can relax things as we can as we go along. So, but basically the groups that have been in place across the industry working on the resumption of the sport will largely stay in place, will meet, will have to consider all sorts of things. Field size limits, when can we relax those? Um, number of fixtures, you know, we've got a program for the next 10 weeks. We're trying to fill them with eight, nine, 10 race cards. 72 um, hour declarations. But what will we do after that? 72 hour decks, I mean, the 72 hour decks is, is something that I would be fairly confident we could relax fairly quickly. But at the moment, there are things that we have to manage within that time scale around uh, medical questionnaires and so on being returned, um, around balloting out of horses, particularly under the two-year-old situation where none of that can be managed on a system at Weatherby's that needs to be manually done and manually checked. So we, we're just giving ourselves a bit of time to make sure that there are no errors, no issues with the published fields mm -hmm. and to make sure that we're good to go because we want to give as many horses as possible the opportunity to run within yeah. the constraints that we have and we want no unnecessary non-runners, Nick, so we're trying to make sure that we go through all the checks properly. But I'd be fairly confident, having spoken to um, Brant and Richard, Brant Dunshay and Richard Wayman, that we will be able to relax that hopefully within the next week. Uh, clearly this is going to be an expensive procedure for the next few weeks as well. How, how is the BHA able to, to carry on financially given, the, given the, the pain that everybody's had to take for the last few months? Well, we receive no direct... The only direct funding we, we receive is from elective activities. So if, if someone wants to have their horse dope tested for a particular substance because they're concerned when they take possession of the horse or whatever. We offer services like that, 
but they're obviously at cost and we receive income directly. If you want to name a horse a long time ahead and reserve that name, then you're electing to do so mm -hmm. and we receive some income from that. Other than that, all of our income comes either from race courses paying a um, uh, race day integrity services fee to us um, or from owners, trainers uh, and other horsemen in the activity of entering their horses where we charge an administration fee. Um, those are the only ways that we raise money. So in the period where no racing was taking place and you know a number of those fees were not payable, um, we've in effect been funded by the levy board. And as a result, what we did was we sought to cut our costs in half. We, we, we've gone as far as we could. We needed to keep about 20% of our staff working to help manage the resumption of racing. Um, but the vast majority of our people work on a race day, and so we were able to stand most of those down and take advantage of the furloughing scheme. Um, so we cut costs significantly. Um, obviously, as revenue streams start to improve again, then we're not saying that we return, we return to full run rate, but at least there's a bit more scope for yeah. income for the BHA at that time. Nick, just finally, uh, where we had a, a conversation back in, in March initially about, about this, just after lockdown, and, and we talked about your own, your own position because you'd already announced that you would be standing down at the, at the end of the year. And I, I said at the time it's not going to be quite the, the landing that Nick perhaps had, had anticipated when, when he made that announcement because nobody could see what was coming. Are you going to stay in situ until the, until the end of your intended tenure? So are you going to stay in situ until the end of this year? Is that your intention? Yeah, fully intending to. Um, uh, my arrangement and agreement um, under my contract, but also in discussion with Anna Marie and the board, when I informed uh, her of my decision back in January, was to serve the year out. Um, there's, at that time, we were thinking that with the horse welfare board strategy being published which is something that I and my colleagues had been heavily involved in bringing about and I was very passionate about ensuring that our sport really focused on that area um, there was the there was the matter of a whip review that we were um, asked, tasked with doing coming out of that so it was going to be important to steer that through the year um, and to deal with you know other um, key aspects around modernizing the BHA and developing its uh, racing admin system and so on so there was plenty to do there's still plenty to do now what I'd say Nick before I finish is that a key point from now on is how we're going to help manage the recovery. Yeah. We've got to take some key steps around the financing of the sport and plan for a fixture list and a set of revenues together across the sport that helps our recovery. And I think we've got a massive opportunity over these next few weeks to really showcase our sport. And I want to play my part in that um, right until the point where I leave the organisation, which I shall, I'll miss very much. A lot of that you've just touched on, definitely something for another day. But for today, with the resumption of racing, coming back tomorrow, Nick Russ, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Nick Russ, the Chief Executive of the British Horse Racing Authority. Here's what's coming.